What we know of art history today actually has its roots back to the 19th century, but what the study is about dates back to the ancient world. The art historians depend on the semiotics, formal analysis, iconography and psychoanalysis for understanding the history of a piece of art. After the World War II, when photographic imitation and printing techniques improved, reproduction of artworks became easier. Technologies as such have tremendously helped the study of art history to progress in profound ways as they have facilitated easy evaluation of objects. Thus, the study of visual arts can be described as a practice that involves understanding social significance, context and form of art. The chronological pillar of the study is the commemorative history of beautiful creations commissioned by public or religious bodies or prosperous individuals in Western Europe. A renowned example is Canon, which remains prominent to this day and even has its mention on the history textbooks. However, there has been an effort made since the 20th century to define the study to be more comprehensive of non-Western art. In the modern years, art history has come up as a study that focuses in educating people how to assess and construe works of art established on their own perception. Often, art history has been criticized for its bias nature because every individual has their own point of view of seeing and defining things. The study of art history teaches you to appraise what you see based on the art forms that you know already. This eventually develops your aesthetic understanding of a piece of art. Those interested in the study of art history are taught how to evaluate artifacts by numerous methods. It is difficult to understand the subject without knowing about the methods. Methods of studying art history the art historians utilize several methods while researching the history of objects and studying the nature of the being of the art, its creation, existence and authenticity. They mostly examine any work of art in the perspective of the time when it was created. This is done in the best way, keeping in mind the respect of the creator's inspiration and constraints, along with contemplation of requests and predispositions of its patrons. A comparative study of the themes and tactics of the creator's teacher is also done considering the symbolism and iconography of the art. In short, it can be said that the world in which the art was created is deeply examined by the art historians. Art history includes the examining of the work through the study of the form, which is the use of shape, line, texture, composition and colour by the artist. This helps identifying if the creator has used a two-dimensional or three-dimensional picture plane of the architectural or cultural space to create the art. The manner in which these elements are used resulting in different kinds of art known as imitative or abstract art. When the artist creating an art in the imitation of another image or object, then the piece of work is called representational or imitative art. The art is known to be more realistic when the creator is able to create a perfect imitation. When the artist is not trying to make an imitation of an image or object, instead relies on symbolism to capture the essence of nature rather than directly copying it as it is, it is called non-representational or abstract art. Abstraction and realism subsists on a continuum. For example, Impressionism is a representational form of art, but it is not directly imitative, but an attempt to create an impression of nature. If the work of art is not representational, instead is an expression of the creator's aspiration and feelings, or simply a quest for ideal beauty and form, it is known as non-representational work or an art of Expressionism. An analysis of iconography is one in which the focus is kept on the particular design of the element. With a close examination of such elements, the art historians are able to trace their descent and come to a conclusion of the origin and root of the themes of a particular art. It is possible to make many observations in regards to the cultural, social, aesthetic and economic value which were responsible for the creation of the art. Art historians use the critical theory as a base to structure their investigation of the works. 
theory is mostly used when the historians are dealing with more recent objects, like those from the late 19th century and onwards. If we talk about how the critical theory get its matter, well, it can be said that it is often the work of the literary scholars that they borrow to form the analytical base of the study of the artwork. The subject of critical theory is responsible in establishing theories such as Marxist, feminist, post-colonial and critical race. As in the study of literature, you will notice that the scholars take keen interest in the environment and nature, but what turn it will take on the critical study is yet to be determined. Pliny the Elder The earliest writing on art to have survived to this date and can be categorized as art history are paragraphs from the book Natural History written by Pliny the Elder in AD 77-79. The writing was about the Greek painting and sculpture. It is from them that the idea of Xenocrates of Sicyon of BC 208 can be traced. Xenocrates was a Greek sculptor and writer and one of the world's first art historians. Pliny's work consists mainly of an encyclopedia based on science which has been influential after the age of Renaissance. In the meanwhile, developments occurred in China in the 6th century and many worthy artists were recognized by the scholar gentry. These writers were artists themselves being essentially talented in calligraphy. There is a book written by Xi He, Six Principles of Painting, which describes the artists of China. Vasari and Artists' Biographies Giorgio Vasari was a Tuscan author, sculptor, architect and painter who wrote the first true history of art. The personal memoirs of the artists and their arts have been read by many from the Book of Lives of the Painters, written by Vasari. He highlighted the evolution and development of art, which created a milestone in the art history. The account that he has mentioned in the book about the painters has a both personal and historical touch to it. It features the biographies of Italian artists, many of whom were his personal acquaintances and colleagues. Michelangelo also being described as the greatest artists of all time also had a biography written by Vasari, which was very enlightening. Vasari influenced many, mainly by his unique ideas about art. He served as a model for several. His style and approach was highly persuasive until the 18th century and that is when the criticism came along and raised at his biographical account of history. Art Criticism Johann Joachim Winklemann (1717–1768) was a scholar. He criticized Vasari's offbeat artistic personality and argued about the fact that emphasis should be made on the views of the learned men rather than the viewpoints of fascinating artists. That is how art criticism came to exist, through the writings of Winklemann. Out of the many works he did, two of the most notable works that draw the conception of art criticism were Reflections of Painting and Sculpture of Greeks and History of Art in Antiquity, published in Greek in 1755. In the book, Winklemann criticized the artistic immoderations of Rococo and Baroque forms of art and suggested more sober forms of art like neoclassicism. Jacob Burkhardt 1818 to 1897, who was one of the founders of art history. He noticed that Winkelmann was the first person to have distinguished between the periods of ancient art and link the history of art styles with the world's history. Until the mid of the 20th century, the area of art history was subjugated by the academics who were German. Therefore, it can be said that this work was the foundation of art history in the German culture. Johann Wolfgang Goethe and Friedrich Schiller, inspired by the works of Winkelmann, both comments their own work on the history of art. The initiation of art as a major subject of theoretical speculation was made strong by works like a critique of judgment by Immanuel Kant in the year 1790. Furthermore, lectures on aesthetics by Hegel only made the foundation of art history stronger. 
One philosopher was inspired by another and the art history made a strong base to the works of them. Karl Schnase was highly inspired by the works of Hegel and was responsible in establishing the philosophical foundation of art history as an independent subject. He conducted one of the first historic surveys of the art history from the ancient times to the Renaissance. This immensely helped art history to be taught in the German-speaking universities. Stylistic Study Jacob Burkhardt, being one of the founders of art history, was mentor to many. Heinrich Wolflin (1864–1945) was one of them. Now, he is known as the father of the modern history. He taught in the universities of Basel, Munich, Zürich and Berlin. A number of pupils made a bright future for themselves in the career of art history. Wolflin introduced the perspective of art history by giving it a scientific approach, concentrating on three concepts. His first concept was to study art with the use of psychology, especially with the help of Wilhelm Wundt. Wundt was the first person to have called himself a psychologist. One of the many things that Wolflin argued about was that art and architecture are good if they resemble the human structure. The second concept was the idea of studying art through comparison. When an art is compared to another, it is easier to distinguish different styles. The book he wrote, Renaissance and Baroque, was based on this idea and it was a first of its kind to show how one period style differed from the other. Unlike Giorgio Vasari, Wolflin was not interested in biographies of artists. He had also proposed to create art history without any names. The third concept was of studying art based on the idea of nationhood. He showed an extra interest in finding out if there was particularly an Italian style and a German style. Vienna School Coexistent with the career of Wolflin, University of Vienna, a major school of art history, developed. Franz Wickhoff and Alois Riegel were the first batch students of the University of Vienna to have studied under Moritz Thausing, and both were bright students. Both were specialized to assess the neglected or criticized work of art. Both Riegel and Wyckoff wrote widely on the late antiquity of art, which seemed to be declining from the classical ideal before them. The valuation of the Baroque was also a contribution from Riegel. The University of Vienna had a faculty including important people like Max Tvorshak, Hans Tietze, Josef Strigovsky and Julius von Schlosser. Many who studied in this university were important art historians of the 20th century, including Ernst Gombrich. The term Second Vienna School or New Vienna School refers to the institute opened by the past out students of the University of Vienna, including Hans Seldmeier, Guido Kaschnitz von Feinberg and Otto Pacht. They began the school in the 1930s, they intended to work on the concept of Rico, even tried to develop it, the concept of Kunstvollen, into a full-fledged methodology of art history. Zeltmeier excluded the study of patronage, iconography and other methods used in the context of art history, instead he emphasized to concentrate on the aesthetic qualities of art. This resulted in a bad name for the Second Vienna School due to irresponsible and unrestricted formalism, adding shade to it was the unconcealed racism of Seldmeier and his membership in the Nazi party. Iconography In the 1920s, a group of professors assembled in Hamburg. Erwin Panofsky, Fritz Sachse and Abby Warburg were the most prominent amongst them. The three of them established most of the vocabulary used by the art historians till today. The meaning of iconography is symbols from the text, which refers to the theme of art resulting from the written sources like folklore and scriptures. Iconology is a wider term which refers to symbolism in general, it is not text specific. The art historians of today often interchangeably use these terms. 
Panofsky took to the theories of Frigel at the beginning of his career, but later got engrossed in iconography. He had a particular interest in the conduction of themes relating to the ancient classical history of Middle Ages and Renaissance. Panofsky was a professor in the University of Hamburg. His interests were shared with Warburg, who belonged to a wealthy family. Warburg's family had opened a remarkable library dedicated to the study of classical mythology of art and culture in Hamburg. Later, under the sponsorship of Saxe, this library was turned into a research institute associated with the University of Hamburg. After the death of Warburg in the year 1929, Saxe and Panofsky, who were both Jewish, were made to leave Hamburg. Both found new destinations for themselves. Panofsky found a place for himself in the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Saxe established himself in London, bringing along the library of Warburg, founding the Warburg Institute. Both of them were German-speaking men with extraordinary knowledge as art historians stepping into English-speaking universities in the 1930s who were still novices in the subject of art history. These scholars were the ones accountable for establishment of art history as an independent field of study in the English universities, adding to which the course of art history of America was determined, particularly due to Bonofsky's methodology. Psychoanalysis One of the scholars who appealed psychological theories to art history was Heinrich Wolflin. However, he was not the only one to have thought in that direction. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, wrote a book on the renowned artist Leonardo da Vinci. He used the artist's paintings to cross-examine his psyche and his sexual inclination. Freud concluded from the analysis he made by Leonardo that he was most probably a homosexual. It is contentious among the art historian to perform psychoanalysis on retrospective material, particularly because the sexual behaviour were different in times of Leonardo's than of Freud's. Psychoanalysis is still endeavoured by scholars. Laurie Schneider Adams is one of the renowned psychoanalytic scholar who wrote a textbook by the name of Art Across Time and the book called The Art and Psychoanalysis. In the year 1914, when Sigmund Freud printed the psychoanalytical version of Michelangelo's Moses, the history of art criticism took an unpredictable turn as it was the first ever psychoanalysis on a work of art. Freud had originally printed this anonymously for reasons unknown. Archetypes Cartoon was a Swiss psychiatrist and the founder of analytical psychology. Like every other scholar, he was a unique and influential thinker as well. He had a different approach to psychology and emphasized on understanding the psyche through the exploration of the worlds of mythology, dream, art and religion. He concentrated most of the years of his life in Western and Eastern philosophy, sociology, astrology, alchemy, arts and literature. His most well-known contributions include works such as The Collective Unconscious, Theory of Synchronicity and his concept of psychological archetype. Jung did not believe in coincidences. He suggested that indication of corresponding events is a mere reflection of our lifestyles. He debated on the point that archetypal imagery and collectible unconscious were perceived in art. The American abstract expressionist was particularly moved by his ideas in the 1940s and 1950s. His work was the core inspiration of the surrealist concept of drawing images from the dreams and unconsciousness. Jung stressed on the importance of harmony and balance in nature. He warned that the modern times human has become too dependent on science and would benefit from assimilating little spirituality and escalate their unconscious realms. Jung's work elicited the work of art historian along with becoming an essential part of creating art too. Jackson Pollock, an American painter, created few artworks along with his sessions of psychoanalysis given by Dr. Joseph Henderson. Later, Pollock's drawings were published by Henderson to display the power of drawing as a therapy. 
The heritage of psychoanalytical art history is deeply rooted and carries on even after Jung and Freud. <laughs>